It's Ridge Racer. Ridge Racer. No, 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 no. It's pronounced. R4 Ridge Racer Type 4 is a racing game with an arcade style slant that was made by Namco and was released in 1998 for PlayStation. Sadly, the last console Ridge Racer release was in 2012 and for the most part the series is kind of dead and mostly remembered for that meme clip I just played from an old E3 conference. This is really a shame because there are some really solid games in the series and the ones that came out in the late 90s and early 2000s have some of my favorite music of all time. Yeah, I said music, not just video game music. In fact, that's how I found out about Ridge Racer Type 4. I have been jamming out to its soundtrack all the time for the past few years after finding it randomly on YouTube, and I figured at some point I should probably actually play the game if I love the music this much. I'm really glad I gave it a shot too because despite not ever really playing racing games like this before, I was hooked. The incredible music combined with the razor sharp gameplay mechanics made for a really thrilling experience and all this was presented with some of the best graphic design and stylistic choices I've ever seen in any game. Let's actually start off by looking at that graphic design because I think graphic design and UI can really add a lot to the experience of a game but it's often overlooked. It's actually kind of hard to overlook this aspect though when you're playing Ridge Racer Type 4 because this game is just bursting at the seams with style. The bold yellow and black color palette makes a statement and is all over the stylish menus that you navigate. This is some of the most aesthetically pleasing UI I've ever seen and considering that this game is mostly just racing and selecting what type of racing you want to do from menus, it's really important that they got this right. You can really notice what this adds to a game when you look at a game comparatively that lacks this. Our racing evolution for PS2 is in the Ridge Racer series, but it lacks the amount of vibe and style most Ridge Racer games have due to its super generic menus and presentation. I do love these really weird titles though. Our racing evolution is so unnatural to say, but it's somehow cool. However, it's not as cool as the fact that this game is called R4 Ridge Racer Type 4. It may seem like a small thing, but it shows that they valued style over coherency and marketability because who cares if it sounds confusing if it's cool. Now that I'm looking at this box art though, I'm starting to wish we got the Japanese box art over here. The North American box art is cool, but it just looks a little too bland and doesn't capture the hype feeling this game has. Also the Japanese box art has this pretty nonsensical blurb paragraph and it's just another dumb fun thing about this game's graphic design presentation. And hey, another thing that adds some dumb fun is all the custom decals you can add to your car in garage mode. You can even make your own designs with this little Animal Crossing style pixel art creator thing, which happens to have a very aesthetically pleasing design itself. Okay, so you've picked out your Yoshimitsu decal and you're ready to race. So far, Ridge Racer has nailed it on all the audio and visual presentation. But what's most important in a racing game is that its core racing mechanics are really tight. Thankfully, this racing system nails the arcade style and has really fun driving that mostly revolves around the super satisfying drifting mechanics. Something kind of unique to Type 4 is that there are two kinds of drift that you can select for your car, either grip or drift. Both are activated in similar ways by letting go of the accelerator for a second and then hitting it again. This took a little while to get used to as the only racing game I've really played before this was Mario Kart which has a dedicated drift button that allows you to keep your pedal to the gas the whole time. However, this drifting system where you time your release and repress has a subtle complexity that gives this seemingly simple racer its addicting depth. Adding even more depth is that choosing the drift or grip style of drifting will give you two completely different gameplay experiences. Grip is a more consistent and subtle drift, so it's less risky but it can't hit the super tight turns in the same way as its counterpart. I found it easier to win with, but it felt slightly less rewarding to do so. The drift style is much more challenging and risky to play with, but that's what makes it so much more fun. You can hit incredibly sharp turns with this style, and sometimes you have to hit your drifts in a super last minute timing, which is super satisfying to pull off when it's combined with a great sound design. Hitting these tight drifts will really make your heart race though, because bumping the wall even slightly can set you back quite a bit in speed. Thankfully, on every difficulty except Expert, the game is pretty forgiving and you can definitely make a decent amount of mistakes and still come out winning. I never really ended up having a perfect race in my playthroughs, but that's part of what makes it so exciting. I would always seem to get these nail-biter finishes where I would win by such small margins at the very last second. Because you start out in last place every time, races almost always play out in a way where you're clawing your way desperately up to first. The AI seems to be programmed in a way that gives just the right amount of challenge to allow you to progress up the positions so that you just barely have enough time to get to first by the end. I'm not entirely sure if this is really the case, but the amount of times I won by a whisker made me believe that there had to be some sort of intentional design there. Whether or not that's really the case, the fact is these races got my blood pumping and they were always intense. 
It was especially satisfying to finally win a tough race because the game is entirely skill-based. There's no power-ups or shortcuts, and the computers don't try to mess you up that much, so you won't be pulling your hair out from any RNG or anything like that. It's a game purely about mastering the solid core driving mechanics. But how much would those core mechanics really matter if you didn't have any fun tracks to use them on? Thankfully, Type 4 has some really well thought out courses that all have a decent amount of unique flair. So yeah, the track design in general is really solid. But I do have to mention that this is one area where being on the PS1 hurts this game, because the draw distance can really screw you over sometimes. The exact angle of a turn can be deceptive before you get to it, but the game does try to telegraph its turns in other ways to make up for this to some degree. I think they did the best they could with the hardware, and at the time what they pulled off was pretty innovative. But some tracks will just take a little practice before you're ready for some of the less telegraphed turns. Thankfully though, the tracks are always a really satisfying length, so by the time you've tried them a few times, you'll start to get into a flow state where you start to recognize the patterns you want to approach turns with. It's not always best to take every turn with a drift, so mastering a track means having to balance knowing when to simply accelerate, to brake slightly, or to go all in with a drift. Eventually you'll start thinking one turn ahead of the one you're currently on, and it really makes you feel like a master of the course when you hit a sequence of tough turns consecutively. After doing a ton of satisfying drifting on all the courses, it's a little odd that the final track of the single player mode doesn't share that same design philosophy. Before you start the final race, you're given a much faster car which ends up de-incentivizing drifting. So all the lessons you learned before don't really apply as much to this track, and winning comes down to just flooring it while hitting the corners as tight as possible. Most of the nuance and challenge of this map comes down to where you start the arc of your turn, which is a neat different style of gameplay, but it doesn't exactly serve well as a grand finale. I mean, despite that, this is still a solid track in its own way, and it's well designed around its different gameplay style. So even if I had minor gripes with a course or two, I still had a good time usually because these tracks are really aesthetically pleasing. I think the 32-bit style is starting to have a bit of a revival in modern times, and I can really see why here. The lo-fi, wonky polygons have a real charm to them, and it's always cool to see developers from the time push past those limitations with stylistic flair. Some aesthetic highlights are tracks like Brightest Night, which is a perfect night cruising stage that has the biggest jump in the game which is always fun to go over. Heaven or Hell is another standout visually, for its stunning vistas and mountainous terrain that'll take you through peaks and valleys that will really challenge you, but their sheer beauty will motivate you to want to conquer them. So all the tracks are pretty great. Ridge Racer Type 4 unfortunately only has 8 courses though, which is a bummer, but at the very least you do get a few bonus modes you can play in and the option to race courses in reverse if you want. Adding to the replay value is that you can get a bunch of trophies that serve as challenge runs for experienced players. There's also over 300 cars to unlock, most of which aren't really that unique, but hey, it's still something to keep you playing if you're really into the game. The game also came packaged with demos of the original Ridge Racer, Klonoa, and Tekken 3 on a bonus disc. And oh my god, this menu theme is intense as hell, what were they thinking? So anyways, my point is, even though the core of the game does lack a little bit in terms of content, the rest of the package does make up for it to some degree. But hey, what Type 4 lacks in track quantity, it makes up for with track quality. I had a lot of fun with each track and found their challenge level to be really fun and allowed for a few different playstyles based on the car you wanted to use. The solid course designs combined with the great aesthetic variety in them definitely added to the game's effortless sense of style and was a big part of its distinct personality. Another thing that adds to this game's distinct personality is that for a racing game, Ridge Racer Type 4 surprisingly has a decent little bit of story. Between the four different teams you can choose for the main single player mode, Grand Prix, you get a little unique story for each. Now there's not much dialogue in total, but the game does manage to squeeze in a little character development in each story. A couple of them even try to have some tear-jerking twists. These moments aren't really earned because they mostly come out of nowhere, but hey, it was a fun touch and added that little bit of extra cheese that I love. Everything about these stories are really earnestly corny and add to that great sense of identity Ridge Racer Type 4 has. And now the stories aren't mind blowing, but they added enough of that little bit of variety to encourage me to play the same Grand Prix four times over. When you do play through all four, you'll notice that the stories of the different characters sometimes overlap in cool ways too. For instance, the first team I raced with was the Pac-Man Racers, and their coach's story focused on the guilt that they felt for an accident that killed their teammate, Giuliano. It wasn't really their fault that the accident happened, but they blamed themselves anyway. Then I played the Italian team story and the coach there eventually revealed that Giuliano was his son and that after his death it left a hole in him that he tried to fill by seeking out someone who could perform the perfect race. This little overlap in the storyline added a depth that I kind of wasn't expecting at all, but honestly it left me satisfied and the little epilogues at the end are the perfect emotional cap off to each story. So yeah, there actually are some moments in the game that aren't just purely dumb fun, but you know what would always put a smile on my face from how dumb it is? 
the super over-the-top hype announcer. They have a few things they say during the race depending on context, like when you're about to take first, they'll be like, take which always hypes me up and made me really want to get into first place. Then when you're on the last lap, they'll be like, okay, this is my and that kind of legitimately helped me a lot. It made me focus and take it easy when the tension was at its highest. The best part of the announcer though, is that when you beat the Grand Prix, he either starts praising your team or totally roasting them depending on what you chose. I love the one when you win with the Dig team. Hey now, a win by the Dig Racing Team. Woohoo! this is a shocker ladies and gentlemen. Who would have thought this could happen? You guys were always the first to come in last place. Now do keep in mind, this is your reward for beating the game on Expert. Your team just getting roasted for a whole minute. It was so dumb and funny, I couldn't help but love it. Okay, last thing about this announcer. When you're doing time trials, if you do worse than your personal best, they'll always say this line. And I just want to say, announcer's grandma, if you're out there and you can hear me, let's race split screen. I know you can't beat my times. Oh man, I really can't get enough of the vibe of this game. It has so much personality and style, but the thing that definitely adds the most to that vibe is definitely the music. There were five different composers, yet the game had such a cohesive sound and every track had my head bobbing and sucked me into the race. Now racing games are known for often having good music, but Ridge Racer Type 4 blows past those high expectations and it's easily in my top 5 video game soundtracks of all time. The entire OST is hit after hit and you can easily listen to this as if it's a regular album. That's not to say it's detached from the game though, no, these songs are 100% made for the tracks they accompany. They perfectly set the mood and it always feels like the track changes up its vibe right as you're like two thirds through the race and are starting to feel the pressure. For some tracks you get like a disco funky kind of vibe and some you get intense thumping techno and some just invent entire new genres. Every song is so rich with atmosphere and they have so much variety to their different sections. I've personally taken a lot of inspiration from this OST for my music and I really hope more people give this a listen because it's really something special. Okay, wow, I think I even surprised myself with how much I had to say about an arcade racing game from 1998, but hey, R4 Ridge Racer Type 4 is just so much dang fun that I felt like I needed to spread the word. If you like this video, I hope you give this game a whirl, or at least add its OST to some of your playlists. Speaking of, let me know some of your favorite video game OSTs in the comments, especially if they can capture some of the magic of this one, because I've been chasing after the high from this OST, but nothing so far hits quite the same. Also, let me know what other games you'd like to see covered on the channel. Right now I'm working on a couple scripts, one for a review of Ekenfell, which is another game with incredible music, so subscribe if you want to see that. Anyways, thanks so much for watching the video, and I hope you have a great day. Bonus stage. Okay, I can't help myself, I have to talk about this. The special edition release of the game was packaged with this freakish controller for more accurate control. And speaking of weird peripherals, the special edition also added Pocket Station compatibility, but the Pocket Station actually never released outside of Japan, sadly. Now researching this was actually the first time I've ever heard about the Pocket Station. It seems to be a weird attempt by Sony to compete with the Dreamcast VMU. However, it came out five years into the PS1's life cycle, and its manufacturing was mishandled initially, so it didn't have much of a chance to get really super popular enough to justify a release in the US and Europe. But let's not end on a sad note. If you're dying to play Pocket Station for some reason but can't import it, you can play it on an emulator such as PK201, which I'll link to in the description. Okay, this time the goodbye is for real. See you later and I hope you have a great day.